Good morning. Welcome to our worship service. Let me address the elephant in the room first and get that over with. Uh, I do have a knee that has been bothering me for the last two or three weeks. Then yesterday I was playing basketball and twisted it pretty good, so I can't put much weight on it. Enough about me. Let's worship the Lord together. <laughs> Let's all stand. From Psalm 98, 1 through 3. Sing a new song to the Lord, for he has done wonderful deeds. His right hand has won a mighty victory. His holy arm has shown his saving power. The Lord has announced his victory and has revealed his righteousness to every nation. He has remembered his promise to love and be faithful to Israel. The ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for this day, Lord. We uh, thank you for your presence here with us. And Lord, we thank you for salvation. And we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, just for each one of us. Father, we pray that you will be with us today, that you will help us to hear your word and do what you say. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise you in the morning. Praise you in the evening. Praise you when I'm young and when I'm old. Praise you when I'm laughing. Praise you when I'm grieving. Praise you every season of the soul. If we could see how much you're worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely we would never cease to praise. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise you in the heavens, joining with the angels, praising you forever and a day. Praise you on the earth now, joining with creation, calling all the nations to your praise. If they could see how much you're worth, your power, your might, your endless love, then surely they would never cease to praise. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that, everything that, everything that has breath praise the Lord. I will love you, Lord, always, not just for the things you've done for me. And I will praise you all my days, not just for the change you've made in me. But I'll praise you, for you are holy, Lord. And I'll lift my hands for you. So much more for you are awesome, God of the nations, Lion of Judah, Rock of the ages, Alpha Omega, you're worthy of all praise. More than these hands I'll raise, I'll live a life of praise. I'll live a life of praise. I will serve you, Lord, always, for you are my strength. When I am weak and I will never be afraid, for you are my rock and you protect me. But I'll praise you, for you are holy, Lord. 
and I'll lift my hands, for you are worthy of so much more. For you are awesome, God of the nations, Lion of Judah, Rock of the ages, Alpha Omega, you're worthy of all praise. More than these hands I'll raise. I'll live a life of praise. I'll live a life of praise. I will love you, Lord, always. compassion and mercy and grace with your banner of love over me i am longing to see you one day face to face and to be with you endlessly lord how lovely you are to me lovely lord you are all to me lovely lord for the purity worthy of honor and majesty lord how lovely you are to me you are bright as the sunrise and fairest of all unto you all the glory will be you are god of creation and lord of my life i will worship you faithfully lord how lovely you are to me lovely lord you are all to me lovely lord full of purity Lord, how lovely you are to me. We will worship the name of the holiest one. We will worship your excellency. We will give you the glory for things you have done and be thankful eternally. Lord, how lovely you are to me. Lovely Lord, you are all to me. Lovely Lord, full of purity, worthy of honor and majesty. Lord, how lovely you are to me. Lord, how lovely you are to me. Lord, how lovely you are to me. Oh, Holy Father, as we have gathered here in your house this morning, we praise your holy name. We honor you. We worship you. We adore you. We just thank you for who you are. So rich in love and grace and mercy. So rich in righteousness and and on and on and on what a great and awesome god you are and we thank you for loving us we thank you for loving us so much that you sent jesus christ to be the one who died in our place that we could have our sins forgiven and have eternal life god i just thank you that we can gather together as your family and worship you and honor you that we can lift up to you the concerns and the burdens that are on our hearts in prayer And Lord, we just do that very thing right now. We just trust in your word. We trust in your promises. We know, Lord, that you have said that we can lift to you anything. We can cast our cares upon you. Because you care for us. You love us. And so we do that very thing. We pray for those who are in need this morning. Those that are in need of a physical touch of your hand. We pray for those that are in need of an emotional touch of your hand. We pray for those that are in need of of other things. Maybe it's a relationship problem or financial problem or 
or just whatever, Lord, the need might be, whether it's in our family, our friends, our neighbors. And we pray, Lord, your will would be done and that your name would be glorified in each and every one of these lives that we lift to you right now. We pray also, Lord, that you would be with us and that you would give us ears to hear, hearts that are open to receive your word, your word of comfort and challenge, and that we would put your word into practice in our lives as we leave this place because, no, Lord, we know that it will also be a word of challenge. Lord, we do honor you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. This is the first Sunday of the month which means it's a time for us to recognize our May birthdays. So if the May birthday people would come forward. Seventh, May seven. So May seven, May twenty two, and May seventeen. Thank y'all very much. And do we have any May anniversaries? May anniversaries, come on up. They can stand right there, just as long as they're in front of the camera, they'll be good. And how long have you newlyweds been married? How many years have y'all been married? Seventy-five years. Hang on, hang on, we gotta get this recorded. Our anniversary is on the 27th, and it's such a wonderful occasion that the government has even made a holiday on that day. It's a Memorial Day. <laughs> 75 years. Man. Well, I'm All not right. even 75 well, years sing, old yet. Let's sing happy anniversary to these folks. I could be 74 years old. I'm glad I'm just uh, 54, though. That's great. <laughs> well, <laughs> I want to welcome you all to the Lord's house. We're glad you're here. I know the Lord has a blessing for you for having been here and worshiping with us on this day. Uh, by way of announcement, we do have an offering plate at the back. Uh, for your tithes and your offerings, you can use the GiveLify app on your phones, or you can use your bank's bill pay service. All great ways of getting your tithes and your offerings into the church. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask the kids if they would like to go to the back and get their containers, and let's take up our Diamond Day Missions offering. All the monies that come in do go to support our missions uh, uh, affiliate, Love and Faith Ministries in Honduras.
That is awesome. There is a couple of other announcements I guess I should have made. First of all, again, thank you to all the kids that uh, were earning their awards at uh, Honor Council on last Wednesday evening. Uh, if you were not able to be here, make sure you find a Facebook post. I know some of you don't have Facebook, but find someone who does have Facebook and look at all the pictures of all the kids and the families that were involved in our uh, CLC Life Club uh, Honor Council last Wednesday night. What's that? I did. CYC CLC Life Club. Yes. Uh, also, uh, coming up in June, June 9 through 12, will be our Vacation Bible School from 6.30 to 8.30 in the evenings. If you would like to help out with that, you need to contact Helena. And we usually make this into an entire church event. In other words, kids up through sixth grade can go through the program, but all of the adults and teens can be involved in some way or another, either with one of the crews that's going around from the various stations or at a station or with registration or there's always in a photography, there's always some place somewhere for all of you to be involved. So we'd like to have make this an entire church event. And Talina will be calling nights to work on uh, the decorations uh, soon. It will not start this coming Wednesday night because this coming Wednesday night we have a board of administration meeting uh, to discuss the, uh, the, the questionnaire that was sent out by the conference. So if you're on the board of administration, you should have got an email. If not, uh, talk to me and I'll make sure that uh, we're in contact. But that's 6.30. Wednesday night for a board of administration. One other announcement, and that is a week, not a week, a month from today, a month from the day, June 2nd, will be the day that we will honor our graduating seniors. And we have two among us, not here this morning, but uh, Johanna Grossman will be graduating from uh, North Garland High School, and Addison Mountner will be graduating from Roy City High School and from Paris Junior College with an associate's degree. Yeah, Johanna May, I'll have to check with her and see if she did the, the dual credit as well. I'm think, I know her brother did, so I'm thinking she did too. But anyway, June 2nd will be the day that we honor them. And so if you have a graduation gift that you would like to give to them, that will be the Sunday to bring it. They'll have their table set up, and I will honor them in the morning worship service on June 2nd. All right? All right. Children are dismissed to go to junior church, and we do have a nursery available for those that are of nursery age. All right, last week we started a series called Faith Without Works is Dead. We didn't use the James passage that talks about faith without works is dead, and that's okay because we uh, are, are looking at different ways in which to get our faith involved, and that's why we say it's more, you need more than just faith because if you truly have faith in Jesus, then you will be involved, and there will be things that you do in other words, works that follow. Works don't come first, but works are a result of a true faith with God. And uh, there's, there's this age-long discussion. What can I do to inherit eternal life? Remember last week we addressed that question because it was about the, the rich young ruler. And by the way, you have to put all three gospels together to get the fact that he was rich and that he was young and that he was a ruler because not one gospel says that the rich young ruler. So we put them all together and we get that name for this young man who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, that's where we started. And let me say that we have always believed and preached that faith alone is the way. Now, there's this age-old question, is it faith alone or is it works righteousness? And that's where 
we get muddled down. Is it faith or is it works? Well, I believe the Bible teaches that you cannot earn your salvation. It is by grace it is by the grace of God that we're saved, lest anyone can boast. Ephesians tells us that. But being saved should come with a warning label on it. A warning label that says, working for Jesus. You know, you know that little label that's on your pillows that says, do not remove. Right? What's that going to say? Under penalty of law. Yeah. And so you see that, 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 that uh, tag on your pillow and you go, what? This is my pillow. I can take that off if I want to. Well, it's kind of the same thing. As a child of God, we should have a label like that on it that says, working for Jesus. And the only one who has the authority to remove that label, if he ever was going to, would be the maker of your life. And his name is Jesus. Last week we looked at surrender, right? Not just a haphazard surrender, but a, not, not like you're wrestling and say uncle or tap out or something. No, it's a full, total surrender. The kind of surrender that says, I wave the white flag. I give up. I give it all to you, God. I'm no longer in control of my own life. Now I want Jesus Christ to be in charge. I want him to have 100% of what goes on and what happens in my life. And my life is no longer uh, doing what I want to do, but it's doing what God directs me to do. And that's what total surrender is all about. With that kind of faith, your works won't be dead. Your faith will be alive in Christ Jesus, and it will accomplish what Jesus desires it to accomplish when he's running your life. If you have surrendered to God, then you are able to find the second piece of the puzzle in this um, faith without works, without works is dead. And the second piece of the puzzle is this. Everything we have and ever will have belongs to God. If we're totally surrendered and our lives are totally surrendered to God, we will not do what uh, we want to do, but we will do what God requires of us in every aspect. Everything has to be turned over to God. And what He gives us and what we get has been acquired because of the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God. You have a great job? Praise the Lord. You have a nice car? Praise the Lord. You have a good house? Praise the Lord. You may be a stay-at-home mom raising one, two, three, four, or however many kids. Great. But it all belongs to God. Now, when I was a kid, I didn't have much, I didn't have as much as some of my other friends did. But to me, everyone around me seemed to be the same. You understand what I'm saying? When I was growing up, I, I had what I needed. I didn't always have the best, but I learned to be thankful for what I was given and what I had because I saw uh, some who had it worse off than I did. You understand where I'm going? I'm thankful for my family, for my parents, for providing for me what I needed. And as I got older, I began to realize that my parents were great stewards of what God had given them. We as a family were happy. We were satisfied. We had what we needed because they were living out the principle right there in front of me that all that we have really belongs to God. Now, God is teaching me and continues to teach me that all I have is His and comes from Him. So again, the second piece of this puzzle is we live out faith by being good stewards of what God has given us. Now, if you're beginning to get uneasy because you think this is another tithing message coming your way, you're missing the big picture of the lesson today. Tithing is a thing, but it's not only a portion of the thing that we're talking about this morning. You have to put a couple of things together to get the whole lesson. What I mean is, and, and well, let me, let me tell you what I mean by telling you how most Americans handle their money. The average credit card debt in America is $5,733 per each household adult. So if there's two adults in a household, 
the average credit card debt is $10,000. I think you might actually have to go a little lower than that. I'm not really sure. And that's not counting. Yeah, lower. Yeah. And that's not counting school loans. That's not counting school loans. The average credit card credit score, the credit score among Americans is between 650 and 675. So if yours is higher than that, great. If yours is in that area, you're average. If it's lower, sorry. You can get it up. About 25% of Americans are debt-free, and most of those have gotten to that point after they tanked their finances, and over time were able to build them back up. I remember when we were young, we had three little kids, twins, in diapers. Some of you have kids in two or more diapers, kid, diapers and kids, kids in diapers at the same time. You know how difficult it is. And we had to borrow money. We had family that we were able to borrow it from, but we had to borrow money. I, we understand. We get it. Now, 25% are debt-free, but it's because at one time they probably already tanked. So I say all that to say this. God is not afraid to talk about money. In the Old Testament, God tells his people that the first 10% of the harvest or 10% of incoming income belongs to the Lord. And it's to be used in their day and time to supply the storehouse in our day and time to supply the church for what it needs to continue to be the church of God and to reach those that are in need around us. I say the Old Testament because some argue that, the, that God doesn't require a tithe in the New Testament. Doesn't say anything about it. Well, he does say it to the Pharisees when you tithe. He did say that, so there is a mention of it. But uh, some would say that the New Testament only references giving, and some have this preconceived idea that he that, that Jesus did away with giving in the church because it's so legalistic. But there are over thirty scriptures in the New Testament on giving, so tithing is the least of what we should be giving to God. I've heard some say that tithing, was, 10% is the Old Testament principle, 100% is the New Testament principle. Well, it all belongs to God, right? So that's kind of where we're going. Now, back to how we use our money. Of the people who do give to churches, 80% of them give 2% of their income. That's... That's the statistics. Only 5% of people universally tithe 10%. Some say that if they had more money, they'd give more money. Well, that's kind of like a person that promises, well, if I win the lottery, if I get a great inheritance, or I'll do a lot of good things for my family or for needy people or for the community or for the church. And most of the times, that doesn't happen. Of those, here's an interesting statistic. Of those making forty-five to fifty thousand dollars a year, only four percent are giving anything on a regular basis to the church. Those making a hundred thousand to a million give even less on average. So it's not incoming money that's the problem. Okay, you can let go of your wallets and your purse. I'm not going to take up an offering. I'm not going to ask you to, to make a special request. I'm not going to send out letters uh, saying how much you owe. But what I'm saying this morning is that, that God's word teaches us that we're to give to him. We're to tithe. It's a part of discipleship. And a big part of growing in the Lord, a big part of maturing in our faith is to give a tithe, 10% of our income at least to the church. It's definitely part of surrendering to uh, the things of God to God and being obedient to Him. You will never again be able to say, those of you that are here, those that are here in my voice, those of you that watch this video on YouTube, you will never again be uh, able to say that you did not know you're supposed to tithe. Yes, we are. 
You will never again be able to say, I never understood what the Lord said about tithing. Yes, you do. You're hearing it right now, right here. So in the rest of this morning now, I'm going to talk about getting our hearts right with God because when we do, the other things that we struggle with will fall into line. You see, here's the big issue. When 247 million, 247 million United States citizens identify themselves as Christians and only 1.5 million tithe, it's a heart issue not a financial issue. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Begin in verse 13. Luke 12, 13. Then someone called from the crowd, Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Oh, is that an issue today? And don't families squabble about the estate? It's a shame that they do. Jesus replied, Friend, who made me a judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, Beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all of my crops. Then he said, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Then I'll have enough room to store, to store all of my wheat and all of my other goods. And I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored up for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. How many of you knew that was in the scriptures? Verse 29, but God said to him, you fool, you will die this very night then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not have a rich relationship with God. And then it goes on to say, turning to his disciples, Jesus said, this is why I said to you, do not worry about everyday life, whether you have food to eat, clothes to wear. Life is more than just food. And your body is more than just clothing. And he goes on and talk about things that you've heard before that can be summarized as don't worry about what God will provide for you. So, back up to verse 15. Watch out, it says. Another translation says, Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. In other words, money is not an indicator uh, money is, rather, an indicator of the heart. Money is an indicator of the heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you will not let go of what is not yours, you will not be able to do what God commands you with what is yours. God shows us that out of the 100% of the money given to us, money that we have been blessed with by God, 10% is His, 90% is ours. God shows us in His Word that we, when we are obedient, He will supply our needs. That His portion is to come off the top, not out of what's left over. It's to be the first payment. The first fruits of the harvest was what Jesus said, or what God said in the Old Testament. The first fruits is to come off the top. And I just, I promise you, if you'll tithe off the top, there will be enough for what you need. I remember my dad saying uh, years and years and years ago, God's math is two plus three equals six. He adds two, doesn't he? 
So we read this passage and this, 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 um, this story that Jesus tells. And so this guy's asking about, well, tell his brother to divide. In other words, he's worried about he's not going to get his part of the inheritance. And Jesus tells this story about a man who had a great harvest. He said, what can I do? I know what I'll do. I'll give the rest to the poor. Oh. He said, I'll just tear down my barns, build bigger ones, and save it all for myself. Why do people hoard? Oh, I should say, why do hoarders hoard? <laughs> because they're afraid that their needs won't be met when they have a need. What if I need it and it's not there? Uh, I, know, I know my grandparents uh, and that generation, the great generation, um, lived through the Depression. And many of them were hoarders because they knew what it was like to not have, and so they would stuff it away to make sure they had it when they needed it. And maybe some of us have learned that from them on down through the years. Well, it's kind of a rabbit trail off to the side. You see, it's not about securing a future, and it's not about being... Uh, it's not about securing the future. It's about being a good steward for what we have. We should think ahead. We should plan for the future. We, we should uh, make arrangements for uh, funds that we might need in the future. That's okay. It's not, but just because you have a dollar in your pocket doesn't mean you have to spend it. It's, it's about selfishness. It's about disobedience to the things of God. Um, I, I've, I've heard of a pastor, I knew one pastor rather, that, that uh, required his staff to have their ties taken out of their check before they got it. I don't know that I could work for that particular one because I don't want to tithe because I have to. I want to tithe because I want it to be a personal act of worship. I want it to be an act of cheerful obedience. Because when we give cheerfully, praying that God will use what we give for His honor, for His glory, then it, is, is, it brings blessings. And then you and I could not do it if we were forced to do it. So it's not like taxes that we have to pay. It's something that we do because Jesus has blessed us. And this simple story illustrates a moral and spiritual lesson. The parable is about a man who has been blessed by God and he chooses to keep it for himself. Never once remembering God, never mentioning the helping of others, only maintaining his wealth for his pure personal good. You see, tithing tells and shows God that you're willing to live within your means and give what is required to be faithful and obedient. Tithing tells God, shows God that you're willing to live within your means and to be faithful and obedient. A tithe is a tenth. An offering is over and above the tithe. Some would say that anyone giving to outside ministries should tithe to their church first and then give an offering to others. I don't know. Uh, I've heard it both ways. If you're giving your tithes, uh, but, if you, but I do know if you're giving your tithes like you give your taxes, reluctantly you're missing out on the blessing that God has for you. And that's why Paul says God loves a cheerful giver. We all know generosity is good. And that giving to the local church and to the causes, other causes that, that are faith-based and God-centered is because we do so because we care and we are living out the love of God in our hearts. You know, we're really living out the image of God because God is generous. God is a giver. God is a God of grace. And so we give. We're, being, we're following the example of God. So 
What it all comes down to is that we are to give because it is a, a act of worship and because it is an act of faith and it shows that we, uh, it, it is a work, it is giving and it shows that our faith is alive and well. We know the Malachi passage, Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. As Christians, every decision we make should be made because we love God and that we want to exude His love and His grace to others. Now, if we think this text is only about rich people and rich people in general, people like, oh, I don't know, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, that's not what it's about. If it were, we could simply ignore the message because none of us are in that realm of, of wealth, right? But as we come to a close this morning, if you've only gotten that the preacher is, is after more money in the church, you've missed the point. God wants to honor you, but we don't give just to get. We give because... God has asked us to. No, God has commanded us to. It's about obedience. It's about being sensitive to those around us. It's about doing a heart check and making sure that we're right with God. Because if we're right with God, it is a spiritual issue. It is a heart issue. Then we will give to the church and to the ministry and to the kingdom. Maybe that's a better way of saying it giving to the kingdom of God. And so I have to ask myself, as you have to ask yourself, what are the areas in my life that God is speaking to me about? Where do I need to learn more obedience? Where do I need to learn more stewardship? Where, where do I need to learn to give more? And so we pray Teach me obedience. Teach me stewardship. Teach me to give. And we pray, create in me a clean heart that I might serve you. Let's stand together. Almighty God, as we think in terms of faith without works is dead, we understand that it is by the the things that we do, that we, we show ourselves more than anything, that we have a faith that is real, a faith that is vibrant, a faith that is just, is just exactly where God wants it to be. So God, I just pray that as we honor you through our resources, our time, our talents, all the things that we are stewards of, I just pray that we would surrender them all to you. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. I'm giving you my heart and all that is within. I lay it all down. For the sake of you, my King, I'm giving you my dreams. I'm laying down my rights, I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life. And I surrender all to you, all to you.
I'm singing you this song. I'm waiting at the cross, and all the world holds dear. I count it all as loss for the sake of knowing you, the glory of your name, to know the lasting joy, even sharing in your pain. And I surrender all to you, all to you. And I surrender all to you, all to you. I'm giving you my all that is within I lay it all down for the sake of you my king I'm giving you my dreams I'm laying down my rights I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life and I And all the world holds dear, I count it all as loss for the sake of knowing you, the glory of your name, to know the lasting joy, even sharing in your pain. And I. I just pray that as we go, that you would bless us, that you would guide us, and that you would direct us, that you would speak to our hearts about being good stewards of all that we have, because all that we have has been given to us by you. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Amen.